to our Facebook Live. And here we are. We're so excited to start this Carnivores Anonymous online meeting. Uh, each month, we have special featured guest speakers to share their vegan story and to provide health tips for people who are curious about veganism, interested in trying this new lifestyle. This program is hosted by In Defense of Animals, and my name's Lisa Levinson, and I am your host this evening. I'm very excited to introduce our featured speaker today, so I will do that. So today, we are visited by um, Sergeant Vegan, Bill Muir, registered nurse who he wrote vegan strong the ultimate field manual for a kick-ass plant-fueled life to help people face their fear of change while making the switch to veganism bill left a cushy job teaching english in japan after 9 11 to join the army despite being afraid of heights he became a paratrooper and served with the 173rd Airborne Brigade in Afghanistan as a combat medic. A vegan since 1992, Bill adhered to his plant-fueled diet throughout his rigorous army training and deployment. Since being honorably discharged from the armed services, Bill has earned a certificate in vegan culinary arts from Atlantic Union College and a Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree from Drexel University, and has authored the book Vegan Strong. Now, Bill serves as our nation's, our nation's heroes as a registered nurse at the West Los Angeles Medical Center. So it's really my pleasure to welcome Bill. And I actually lived in Philadelphia for a while too, which is where Drexel awesome. is. Yeah, very exciting. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> was, that, was that a while ago? There are some incredibly awesome vegan places uh, now if, for the, viewers or listeners or whatever hers uh blackbird pizzeria um what's your veg there's so many places philadelphia has blown up yes exactly i was actually living there when those places opened up so i'm so excited to have been able to enjoy them while i was there Pretty so cool. here we are we're both actually in southern california right now and we're excited to hear your story so you're welcome to take it away i know that you've got some visuals here on the screen so well, if you're you. with us you can you might be able to if you're on the phone you may not see them but if you're with us online you will be able to see them so it's really a delight thank you so much well thank you very much welcome everyone i'm bill muir aka sergeant vegan welcome to vegan strong the presentation and without further ado let us begin so my objective with writing vegan strong was to rebrand vegan so in my opinion, for too long, we as vegans were considered a less than awesome thing. Vegan food was considered undelicious. Vegans were often presented as skinny, weak. If there were guys, effeminate, uh, non-masculine, hippies, we smelled weird, and, and all kinds of negative things like that. For me, as a vegan, as someone who's been vegan for 27 years, I wanted to reset the story and say, hey, being vegan only means three things. One, it means someone who cares first and foremost about animals. 97 plus percent of people say that they're animal lovers, but often people still pay people to kill and eat and present them animals to eat. You can't kill what you love, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, secondly, someone who cares about the planet, as now we know climate change is such a, a factor in our world. Most of that is due to animal agriculture. And back when we were hunters and gatherers, it didn't matter. But now with so many people, producing animals to eat doesn't make sense anymore, given the big, uh, given climate change and everything like that. And lastly, I can tell you as an RN who works on a cardiac ward, so many of my patients are with us for lifestyle related diseases. And therefore being vegan, if you're gonna have a chance to avoid a lot of those diseases, why wouldn't you do it? So that's what I, 
what Vegan Strong is, a rebranding of what it is to be vegan, taking out all the propaganda and resetting the conversation. So a little bit about me, my resume, I'm a combat vet. Um, like Lisa said, I served at the 173rd Airborne Brigade in Afghanistan. I'm an RN. I work in cardiac telemetry. And for those that don't know what telemetry is, basically heart monitors, when you watch a TV drama and you see those little blips and squiggles on the screen representing someone's heart rhythm, that's what I do. I monitor that. I have patients that, that are on those rhythm or on those monitors and work with that. Like we mentioned before, I've been vegan for 27 years, so since 1992. So how did I begin? What, how did this whole journey begin for me? I gave up meat for Lent in 1992. So why did I do that? Well, my mom and dad and my family are Catholics. I was raised Catholic and my mom was asking me to give up something for Lent. I was a snarky punk rocker teenager at that point. And I thought, hmm, what would really get to them? And thinking, thinking, thinking. And I said, well, you guys don't eat meat one day out of the week on Fridays during Lent, that which is the 40 days, uh, somewhere between February and March, right before Easter. I said, okay, I won't eat meat all of Lent. Well, people's reaction was super crazy. People thought, oh no, I'm going to die. People thought I was going to go to that mythical protein deficiency ward in the hospital that you hear so much about. And it's the thing of memes all over the internet and all the kinds of nonsense and rubbish. Nowadays, obviously, in 2019, if someone said they're going to give up meat for Lent, you just say, oh, okay, nice, bro. It's just a healthy cleanse. But then it was definitely some stuff. Did I die? Did I get sick? Well, no, I was a college wrestler. I felt great. I was a runner too. No worries there. It was the pre-internet days though. And I had to learn what I knew about veganism. And at that point, cause I wasn't even vegan for the first couple months, just vegetarian. I learned what I knew uh, about stuff from the dictionary of all places. I would have to go, if I, looked up an ingredient that I couldn't eat. For example, gelatin, I would have to look it up in a dictionary. Um, and yeah, it was kind of, kind of difficult, but if something is important to you, no matter how hard it is, you'll be able to do it. Whereas obviously, as we know, and in, in, I live in LA and people say they kill, still can't be vegetarian or, or vegan in 2019. And no matter how easy it is, if it's not important to you, you won't do it. Unfortunately, back in, in the early 90s, vegan cuisine was basically an oxymoron. Uh, if you tried to go to a vegan restaurant, I, there wasn't any in Philadelphia that I knew of. Later in the mid 90s, there were some, some good Chinese vegetarian or vegan restaurants, but nothing, nothing really of, of merit, at least when I began, and just had to eat a lot of poorly made pasta and PBJs. And for those who have the video presentation, that is a Bruce Lee shirt that says Animal Liberation. And the lettering, I think it's something says, it's some kind of ridiculousness about uh, uh, hands and feet or something uh, uh, for protecting the animals, some kind of Kung Fu reference. The cake says happy, and there's probably a bad word there to me, but I got censored because people thought it was, uh, I probably shouldn't have bad words on a birthday cake. And I had to, to bake my own cake because at that time the army wasn't issuing vegan birthday cakes. So I joined the army after 9-11 and I joined as a combat medic. I was walking home from work late one night in Tokyo and I got a text on my phone, something about two tall buildings and a fire the glow of the phone and my tired brain and the kanji characters, it wasn't all coming together. And then someone called and said, hey, you gotta go watch TV. Something just bad really happened in America. You need to just go check it out. So I got back home. I did not have a TV, so I had to go to a neighbor's place. And after a lengthy conversation, explain why I needed to watch the TV. And wow, I mean, watching that in real time, but in Tokyo, it, it just hit me. Being a, an expat for so long, I lived in Japan at that point. 
seven or eight years. And I just felt I couldn't have this cushy, awesome life anymore when people were, were obviously suffering and dying in, in New York and, and there was going to be a, a big work coming up. And I knew it was going to happen. And I knew as someone who was vegan that cared about people as well as animals that I should do something about it. So I got my stuff in order in, in Japan. I left. I went, went back home and I joined the Army. So a little bit about my Army life before we answer, give a very long answer to the question, can you be vegan in the military? So me personally, my Army life, I started off training Fort Benning, Georgia, went to then medic, medic training in Fort Sam Houston, Texas, airborne school back to Fort Benning. Then I did the first two and a half, three weeks of the Ranger INDOC program, and then sent to Italy with the 173rd Airborne, deployed to Afghanistan with them, and the rest is history. Now I work for the VA. So boot camp. Boot camp was, for me, the hardest, uh, hardest but not impossible time to be vegan in the military. So why? Was it because of the training? No, the training is easy. It's basically, you're just working out all the time. That's not difficult. What was difficult is limited access to vegan food. So I've run marathons, I've run them vegan, absolutely no worries when you get enough food. But it's like anything, if you think of food as fuel for a car, a car runs out of gas, it runs out of gas. And when you're trying to just drive on fumes all the time, it's, it's difficult. Again, not impossible, but difficult. So there would be the way the chow hall was set up. They would have a line of food. I guess I have to say that in air quotes because most of it wasn't vegan. Then they would have like a little bit of something like maybe lunch and dinner, they would have like white rice. Uh, there was a salad bar, mostly like what you'd expect, like iceberg lettuce and some, some cherry tomatoes and, and stuff like that. So average day, what did I eat? So I would start off breakfast. The whole chow, chow hall line, was any of that vegan? No. So cereal is often vegan. Corn flakes, frosted flakes, they're vegan. Next question would probably be, so did they have almond milk? No. Did they have soy milk? No. Did they have hemp milk? No. Did they have coconut milk? No. Uh, and no other form of non-dairy milk that you could think of. So I would just eat it dry. So I don't know how many bowls of dry cereal you can eat. And usually I top off at two. I'm just, I just can't do it anymore. It would be gross to put water in there. So I started to put orange juice in there as the only plant-based alternative. Uh, that's pretty not delicious either. And at a certain point I transitioned to coffee. And then I also tried fruit cocktail, which I would say of them all, fruit cocktail might be the least worst, but none of it's good. And then lunch might be rice, uh, some pieces of Wonder Bread, uh, various vegetables, but they often cook the vegetables in butter, so I wasn't gonna eat them. Uh, then there'd be the question, I guess you could wash off the vegetables, you know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, so it was difficult between the, uh, eating cereal, dry cereal, or orange juice cereal for breakfast. And then for, for other meals, maybe having rice or just a rice sandwich. I've definitely had a rice sandwich before. I don't recommend that either. I lost a lot of weight. You can only eat so much of that stuff while you're working out 20 hours a day uh, before you start losing weight. But like I said before, while it was difficult, at no point was it impossible. No, no one was forcing me to eat anything. Yeah, people were uh, drill instructors or drill sergeants might be yelling at me. Just like you might have a family member that's grumpy at you because you're being difficult, not wanting to put a dead animal in your mouth. But is it impossible? No, at no point it's, it's impossible. And the military is not a place for people with thin skin. And I would argue neither of this, is this world. So, so my post... Uh, Post basic training lifestyle was a lot better, a lot less restrictive. I had more freedom of movement. I had a car. I was able to go to restaurants. I wasn't able to do any of my own cooking though. So that would how that would mean is uh, 
I would still have to go to the chow hall and still not be able to eat anything. I would be able to go to restaurants, kind of stock up there. Then I, there was a place called the commissary, which is our version of a supermarket and everything was cheap and I would be able to get food, but I didn't have a refrigerator to store it. So I would have to have that all in my car. So I could tell you from firsthand experience, you can't store soy milk in your car in the summer overnight. It doesn't, it doesn't keep well. And when it becomes a kind of a jello or pudding like substance, you don't want to drink that. I'd be able to make protein shakes though with, uh, well, not in the summertime because that wouldn't keep, but if, if I had some soy milk or some other milk and it was like, especially like the winter time and I left it in my car, I had a blender so I could go make a shake. But I, what I would do is I would drive to, after I went to the gym, I would go to a gas station, look for an outside plug, plug it in and get a banana, get the soy milk, get the, the vegan protein and start blending. And I'd be standing outside kind of like this with the blender, people walking by buying their gas. I mean, yeah, it was probably kind of weird. Um, but vegan, being vegan was only mildly annoying. It'd be like spending time with your in-laws in the Midwest and pick the most um, un-vegan friendly city, but still doable. And this is a picture right here of me. I think that was, me on a jump with the 173rd Airborne. And yeah, those were good times. Airborne school was fun too. Um, none of that was, was particularly bad. I enjoyed running. I enjoyed uh, jumping out of planes, hitting the ground, not as much, but uh, the jump part had its, had its fun points. So that brings me to what is jumping out of a plane actually like? So as a civilian, I can't see a show of hands who's actually done as, as a civilian, but as uh, military, maybe not many people, maybe just me, it's a very different experience. Civilian, you're going really, really high. You have a really big shoot. The advantage of, of going really high is you have a lot of time, if there is an error, to be able to fix the error. And you have a really big shoot, which means you're going to be going very slow, slowly plummeting to the ground to be able to enjoy the experience. In the military, however, you wanna get out of the plane as quickly as possible and on the ground as quickly as possible. Why? Because if you're doing this for real, people are not very happy that you're trying to invade their country and we're gonna be trying to knock you out of the sky. The, how that translates into, into real world uh, feeling in that you're basically, instead of jumping really high and having a lot of time, you get out the door, you have seconds until your chute has to deploy, and then you're ready to crash into the ground. So you, when you jump out of the plane, so you're basically that picture of me with all that equipment, right after that, you get hooked up to the stuff, so you're really uncomfortable, all these straps, and you usually sit out in the tarmac for hours, sometimes having to go to the bathroom, sometimes in the heat, you're just uncomfortable. When you finally crowd into the plane, you're sitting there with all your gear and you're, you're also uncomfortable. So when it's time to get out of the plane and the, and the green light goes, you're like, okay, at least I'm not gonna be uncomfortable anymore. I'll have something new to worry about the, the fall, whether my chute opens or not. You go out of the plane, you jump out, you're in a tight position because you're holding onto your reserve chute. You got a death grip on that, why? Because if for some reason your main chute doesn't open, you could pull your reserve. And you, you want to be in this tight, compact position because if you're all over the place, you're going to spin out of control and it's going to be very bad for you. You jump out, and even if you're in a tight position, you get hit what's called a prop blast, and that's the air from a propeller hitting you. And as you jump out, you get hit with that, and you, go, you get knocked upside down. So as you're falling, you're falling down, now you're falling kind of up and then down because the blast hits you and you go wee like that. But that, this is like a graphic depiction of your body upside down. Near your sight, you can see your reserve chute, which is right here because it's this big, big thing right here. Then you see your boots, then you see the plane flying away and other parachutes. Then hopefully, and for me, all, all times that I jumped it deployed, your parachute deploys, then you get ripped up in the air about what, 15, 20 feet. Whoosh. Then you're coming, you're like, okay, you're relieved because you're probably not gonna die. Then you get in a nice compact position again because you're, you're getting ready because once you hit the 
the tree line, you're going to have to then be ready to roll out of it. And in movies, they'll often have people kind of like walking out of a, uh, a jump. But if you did that in real life, you'd break, well, at least one of your legs. And that's what it's like. So what's, what's also in incredible and interesting to, to think about is by the fifth jump, I was getting used to this, even really being afraid of heights. And I specifically remember my fifth jump because it was a Hollywood jump. That means you don't jump with any of this equipment. You're just jumping with your chute, no rifle, no medic bag, no 100 pounds of equipment, no uncomfortableness. And I remember standing in the door, I was the first person to be out, the, out, out of the airplane. And I'm looking out into a perfect Georgia summer day, really comfortable weather, beautiful sky. It looked like I was gonna be jumping into a really big swimming pool. And I remember just being super at calm, at peace and relaxed. So starting the first couple jumps, it had felt like someone was, was putting a, a firecracker in my brain. And it was just an insane feeling. And at this point, at jump number five, it probably, probably my heart rate didn't go above like 60. I was probably like at a point where I could take comfortably take a nap and I was about to jump out of a plane at 850, 900 feet, something like that. It's interesting to think about that. It's kind of how with the, the looming crisis of climate change and what we do to animals every day, we've also just gotten used to it and grown accepted of, of it. You, you know, we're kind of at, in a lot of ways, the final countdown with our climate and many, are, maybe our species due to climate change and all this awfulness happening. And we're just kind of like, hmm, yeah, it's okay, whatever, bro. It's crazy, huh? Well, with the, the human experience, you can really adapt to anything. So then I was stationed in Italy. And like I said, I can't do a show of hands, but uh, for those who haven't been to Italy yet, Italy is awesome. Whether you're a vegan or not, it's awesome. It's one of my favorite places on earth. I, I love living in Japan, but I also love living in Italy. I spent my weekends in Venice, my, my once a month I would go to Rome and, and being in the army was, was pretty awesome. It was like any other job I've had, except you got to work out for two hours in the morning, which is usually not bad unless you've been out all night and then it could be a drag. And then part of your job is going to shoot guns and practice medicine on people. Or, and I also worked at a clinic, so I wouldn't just practice. I would do give people IVs and, you know, do checkups and stuff like that. So I had access to a kitchen, a car, and some de degree of freedom. So the kitchen is a key point here. So I knew because of my, of my, of my time training that I could make the military into a lifestyle that, that would actually work for me if I was, if I had a kitchen. However, as a lower enlisted, at that point I was an E4. I hadn't, Quite become sergeant vegan i guess i would have been specialist vegan if that was a thing at that point i knew if i had a kitchen i would be able to do really well however because of my rank i wasn't allowed to move off post or move off base and have an apartment yet so what i did i found a friend who also wanted to move off post because we would have had to share the apartment and he had a, a line on the apartment he had done most of the legwork but he needed a roommate and my command was at first not wanting to let me go. But something that I realized was second to the protected status of somebody due to religion, if you had a doctor write you a note about something, they would have to legally go by whatever the doctor said. So I had a doctor basically write me a note that said, hey, this guy is vegan. He needs access to vegan food. He needs, uh, in order to do that, he needs uh, vegan food every day. This is exactly what vegan means. And then I was able to link that letter to the need for me to move off post and get the kitchen. So here's the letter. This was basically my, when I say it, have at the top, if you can see the golden ticket, basically with this letter, I was able to get off post and therefore be able to have 
a pretty independent life while I, while I was living in Italy and training. And being vegan at that point was easy. I would say no more difficult than living in Southern California other than, yeah, I had, you had to speak Italian. But other than the having to speak Italian and read Italian, it, there was plenty of vegan options in every supermarket. There was a local uh, vegetarian cafe that I would get like the seitan platter with a uh, cappuccino con latte de riso, a like rice milk latte. And it just, just mm, awesome. However, going to Afghanistan was not as easy. Before I deployed, I knew that I would have to do a similar thing to what I did with the uh, setting up the kitchen thing. I knew that there was going to be a roadblock, i.e. being deployed, difficult uh, to be vegan, limited access to vegan food. However, if I did the thinking, if I was able to think of the way around the problem, I would be able to solve it for myself. So the first thing that I did, even before I left, I got my address of, of where we were going to be, at least initially. And with enough advance warning, I started to pack, to get food assembled. I got these two industrial size boxes, each of which probably weighed about 75 pounds full. I stuffed it with everything that I might need for a year. So uh, ramen, uh, soy milk, Cliff bars, probably five, six hundred dollars worth of food. I just jammed it all in there, sent them to myself. I thought, hey, no matter what, the first couple months I'm covered. So that was such that was a I think a great idea. However, in reality, I got there. They're giving us a safety brief, and at the end of it, they're like, uh, Doc, bad news, one of your boxes exploded. Now, I didn't think to ask, did it get mortared? Did it actually explode from the outside? That never came into my mind. But what I did think and said at the same time was exploded with kind of a hand gesture too, like of an explosion. And everyone thought that was pretty funny. So for pretty much the rest of the deployment, uh, people would say exploded every time we got attacked or anytime there was an explosion. It, I mean, it was pretty funny, but at the time I was freaking out. I was like, man, and that didn't even care about the money part of it, of all, how much I had put into it and the time and effort. It was more like, what am I going to do? So the first thing I did was surveyed the chow hall situation, like I, AKA the cafeteria, not good. It was basically two Marines who had been press ganged into opening can industrial sized cans like you'd have in a prison, dumping it into this thing and heating it up. Um, yeah, not great there. Some stale bagels some like lettuce and other fruit that was washed with the uh, the local kind of like dirty water that often got people sick. I was like, oh no, I'm, I'm not, this is not looking good. So what I found on post though, especially, and this is the medic advantage working with the local docs, that most of the halal meals were vegan. And halal, for those that don't know, is kind of like the Muslim equivalent to kosher. Most of the halal meals were vegan. We gave them these vegan MREs. So I just started to siphon off of this big pile that was meant for them, halal meals. So I, w I was eating halal meals two or three times a day until I got caught. And I was told uh, no, no in certain terms that we're not supposed to eat their meals. And I was like, well, I can't eat our meals. And they didn't care. So then I made a deal, started to make deals with the, the local docs that I would go to their chow hall. I would bring some of our food, which they found to be a nice novelty, uh, and then traded for like rice or whatever they were eating that just accidentally happened to be vegan. And we did that for a while until they, they said that I, I couldn't fraternize with them at their chow hall. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do? Luckily, I had found out about a website called AnySoldier.com, and AnySoldier.com is a website for a deployed military, and they basically, the whole point of it is if you want to send a care package to people, you can look on the site and see what people need and what people are asking for. I wrote this long thing about what my guys were asking for. They wanted razors. They wanted Maxim magazine. They wanted some chewing tobacco. They wanted beef jerky, and then I wrote a very small thing. Oh, yeah, and then there's a vegan. Well, people saw that and went nuts. They went nuts sending me stuff. They definitely went, like the reaction was incredible. Now, almost immediately, just food started coming in. And I think it was because they, people just thought, hey, it's crazy that 
you know, this was 2005. People couldn't really wrap their mind around, some people couldn't wrap their mind around being vegan at all, let alone in a war zone, let alone under all those, those crazy circumstances. And then through the grapevine, it got, it got back to Tofurky, the company that I, that I was there, and Tofurky themselves sent me like a ton of shelf-stable stuff. And it was great. And so through it all, even though being vegan was tricky, it was never impossible. So this is a big thank you to Tofurky. I actually reached out to them recently and told them again how much I, I love their product, love them and what they do, and uh, had a little conversation with them. I also spoke at the recent Tofurky trot because, hey, I mean, it's very few companies are like that. There's a lot of great vegan companies, but they often get bought up by other companies. But Tofurky has been uh, uh, hanging tough to use a, a new kids on the block reference. So now we're going to talk a little bit about health. As I mentioned before, I'm a registered nurse. Just a, a note, this is uh, not actually me. It's a picture of a dog dressed in a nurse's outfit. So like a lot of people already know, being vegan helps us avoid a lot of lifestyle diseases that are plaguing our country. As vegans, we have a 32% less chance of cardiac disease than meat eaters. Basically what that says is a lot of people who are experiencing heart problems and are on statins have those issues specifically because of what they are doing, not because of the genetics, not because their family had this, that, and the other, and they have a familial history of this. It's because they eat awful food and they are making themselves sick. So if you can have 32% less chance of, of heart disease because of what you do, why wouldn't you? Also, we have less incidences of, of diabetes and obesity. But before people say, hey, vegans never get diabetes, vegans never get obese, I have seen some fat vegans, number one. Number two, diabetes, I don't believe cares if you're vegan or not. It needs, that, it needs you to be healthy and eat a healthy diet. So I think the less diabetes and less obesity is more because vegans are healthy in general, eat healthier and exercise more and therefore don't see them. So I don't think that just because you, you're vegan, you will have zero chance of becoming obese or diabetes. Oreos are vegan. And if you only eat Oreos, you probably will have these issues. So yes, eat vegan, but also eat healthy and avoid junk food and soda. Though I'm, I'm drinking seltzer water, so Sergeant Vegan doesn't endorse any company, but yeah, go for seltzer water, don't go for sugary sodas. So a little bit of uh, Debbie Downer. I hope I'm not the first person to mention this to you, but if I am, that's incredible. Vegans still get sick and vegans still die. You should avoid fat or health shaming other vegans because how does that possibly help? And avoid getting medical advice from Facebook because that's crazy. And I see so many... I'm on so many uh, Facebook groups where I see someone that's just said, hey, I just got diagnosed with this, that, or the other. I'm think, should I go for treatment or should I, I don't know, do this, that, and the other. And people give the worst advice ever. Don't get your medical advice from Facebook. And while it's great, knowledge is power, maybe pump the brakes a little bit about, how should I say this, about doing too much self-diagnosing now, I, I do agree that because someone is a doctor doesn't mean they know everything, but WebMD, a little bit of information can make you a hypochondriac, so just be aware of that. So I, I have at the bottom here, find a healthcare provider who understands vegan nutrition. Very important. Why? Doctors only have a three-credit class in nutrition. I know that because I also had a three-credit class in nutrition as a healthcare provider, as an RN. It's the same class. It's not enough information to really be able to do much of anything. I obviously, as someone who's written a book on the subject, made sure that I read a whole bunch of other books, read a whole bunch of articles. And I feel like I can speak authoritatively on the subject. But if it, doctor, if you took a three credit class in nutrition and that was it, yeah, I mean, when you, when you're, when you look at a patient's uh, protein levels and they're kind of low, you would say, uh, eat more meat. Why? Because that's all you know, and you're not really spending much time reading on the subject. 
you're not thinking too dip, too uh, deeply into you know holistic medicine. You're just okay, band-aid on the problem. So if you if your healthcare provider, if your doctor says you need to eat meat because of X, Y, and Z, A, they don't really know what they're talking about. They're great people, but you know, they're just doing the best they can. And three credits is not enough not enough uh, learning to be to really know what you're talking about on that. Find a different healthcare provider or say, okay, I need to work on my iron levels. Find some vegan source of iron, take an iron supplement, uh, eat more leaf, leafy greens, whatever. But yeah, you don't have to eat meat. Uh, and if a doctor says it, find another doctor, get a second opinion, get a third opinion. They don't say opinion lightly. It is just an opinion. It's an educated opinion, but it's an opinion, number one. Number two, when they say practice medicine, the same practice as practice a guitar. Yeah, it's practice. You know, we're humans. We're not infallible. So because of the internet, vegan has come a long way. We've had new vegan products everywhere. We have vegan restaurants everywhere, vegan celebrities, vegan bodybuilders. I'm going to tell you who my favorite vegan celebrity is, Miley Cyrus. Now, it's not because Sergeant Vegan enjoys her music. Yeah, obviously, uh, whatever she's doing is not, is not meant to be uh, consumed by a 46-year-old former punk rocker combat vet. But I love the fact that she uses her celebrity to endorse eating healthy and not being jerks to animals on the planet. It's incredible. So, hey, I'm kind of a whatever works kind of guy. With all of this, I have to say that it's important to remember, especially for wannabe activists, that the biggest changes that we've had, and to include the push that a lot of people have had toward a plant-based vegan lifestyle, is because of the internet. We've done great things with the internet. We've done a good job of getting the information out. But just remember that the grumpy faces and the hand-drawn signs of three people standing on the side of the road, or even, or even 20, and just that doesn't really push veganism to the same point of, and I know it's gonna sound ridiculous, the Instagram delicious food shot, the being in shape, smiling, holding said food and taking that picture, that is going to push the vegan message more. Why? Because it's positive. It's life affirming. When you just stand somewhere with a, a, an angry sign, more than anything, it just, it promotes the idea that vegans are grumpy and angry. And, and we don't want that. You don't want that. We want more people to get into this. So just keep that in mind. So in 2019, vegan is super easy. It's important to remember that vegan doesn't have to be expensive. Yes, whole paycheck, AKA whole foods can be expensive, but vegetables, rice and beans, none of that was ever expensive. Tofu is still super cheap. Uh, where I get it, it's almost a pound for a dollar 49 at Sprouts. I mean, come on, that, that's, that's ridiculously cheap. It also doesn't have to be complicated for a while. They were saying that with Vegan protein, you have to mix and match your protein due to the amino, balance bound, amino acid balance profile. That's not true either. All protein is complete protein, which includes plant protein. So if you're getting your protein from whatever source, hopefully plant-based, hopefully vegan, and, it's enough, and you're getting enough uh, calories, you're good to go. And lastly, vegan is for everyone, no matter what race, no matter what religion, no matter what uh, sexual orientation, when, no matter what creed, no matter where in America you live or the world, it's for you. So what does vegan strong mean? It means to live a happy and healthy life because, well, why happy, why healthy? Number one, happy. I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but life is very short, so you might as well be enjoying it, number one. Number two, healthy. I've seen a lot of patients but the one thing that people often wish they had was better health. And people are, are usually not complaining that they wanted extra money, especially at like, like 70, 80. They would just rather be healthy and be able to spend that extra time with their friends and family and not being in the hospital. Fit and confident. Fit is going to be different for everybody. Well, no matter who you are, you could be exercising more. Me, I lift weights every day or at least five or six times a week. I also also get on the, the a cycle because of my hip uh, jumping out of planes. The one side 
downside of jumping out of planes is you'll probably bang yourself up a bunch. Uh, and I like to walk at the beach. Why? Well, the, the ocean air and everything like that, it just feels like it rejuvenates me. So that's my level of fit. Now, a lot of people on the Vegan Strong team, they lift weights two, three hours a day because that's their full-time job. And hey, my hat is, well, I don't wear a hat indoors, but you know, my hat's off to you. Keep doing that. Not everyone can do this, but no matter who you are and what your situation is, you should be working out. You should be getting you know, exercise to feel better, confident. Confident, for too long, I think vegans were spreading a vegan message kind of mousy and insecure and just not really sure of themselves. And if you're not sure of the message you're trying to portray to somebody, why should they listen to you? So be confident, at least in what you say, and it's going to go a long way. And lastly, a positive vegan message is important. Why? Nobody needs more negativity. There's enough neg negativity with our divided political climate and with the world these, this day. So be positive. If you're going to be anything, be positive and, of course, be vegan. So that's my book, Vegan Strong. And if you ever see me, uh, ask me. I, I, I have vegan stickers. I'll give you one of these Vegan Strong stickers. And that's it. Thank you for listening to pro uh, my presentation i guess lisa do we do questions now or how do we do this yeah well first of all i want to thank you for sharing your vegan story with us it's unusual for us to have images that go along with it so we got the full picture from you today so thank you and really interesting to hear your your stories about jumping out of planes i didn't know all of that gee and all the the hardship that you endured. I mean, part of Carnivores Anonymous is really people, um, how do we get through these struggles that happen, like trying to find food that's vegan and healthy and yummy, and your dedication to it is so impressive that you were able to, you know, have cereal and and um, figure out the, the scene, even in Afghanistan. That's like phenomenal. It's doable, and hey, and, for us, we live in LA in 2019. While I was talking mostly about how crazy it was to be vegan under kind of unpleasant circumstances throughout the last 27 years and sometimes a war zone, nobody who's listening to this will ever have to go through any of that. All they're gonna have to do is be able, is if they live on this coast, they, hey, what's vegan, can't find anything, how about you go to Carl's Jr., get a Beyond Burger, ask for no mayo, no cheese, done. Yeah, yeah. So now it's just so much easier. Um, yeah, what I'd like, happened, uh, oh, I just changed, uh, just so we, we already saw the webinar. We saw your, your slides, so I'm just opening it up so we can see you as you're talking and also invite other people if they would like to join in. If you have a question, if you're on the phone with us, there's a number that you can call that you received with the login details. And if you're joining us, you can um, click the raise hands button and then we'll call on you if you're in the, the Zoom platform with us. And if not, if you're on Facebook Live, you can ask a question right into the, the news feed there and then we can, we can answer. I mean, Sergeant Vegan will certainly be answering. I wanted to mention, um, Bill, that we've got already um, Michael says, great presentation, Sergeant Vegan, really supportive. Thank you very much. That's great. Just wondering if anyone has any questions. Questions for Bill. You answered a lot of them in your presentation, which was really good. And I just, I had a question. I'm wondering right. like, how did, how did it feel to, when you had that, that outpouring of support? Like, was there a certain moment or a certain, um, new attitude that you adopted from that all that support that there was definitely i went from some mild forms of despair to wow this is going to work out to i got so much food it actually became a burden i know that's going to be sound ridiculous but i had i don't know what it's it's not a connex but i had this industrial sized box that i i had to put all the stuff and it was probably, at one point, I, I, I'd collected like 250, 300 pounds of food. 
So I started to have to give it away. So I went from not having enough vegan food being a problem to now having too much that it was now a problem. Uh, yeah, it felt great. I mean, I, I really do believe that things like this, like the vegan community, uh, it brings people together and it crosses a whole bunch of dividing lines like country and political ideology and like religion and whatever. So like people that most, most of the people that sent me stuff I had never met before. And a, a few people I didn't meet, but most people I, I never, never did know. Maybe, maybe if they see come across something like this, they'll be like, Oh, I sent food to that dude. Uh, Wow, it's truly incredible. It really is. Um, that whole story is, is so interesting. I'm wondering what other people think of it. If you're joining us on the call, or if that moment struck you from from uh, Bill's presentation. Yeah, it was but great. Um, Million Dollar Vegan has a video. I think they're putting out. It's weirdly. So I I'm participating in their 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 pre veganuary push to get people to go vegan. Uh, and today is what is the day they decided to release my stuff. So it's on their, their Facebook and their Instagram. And there's a whole thing with, they, they, they intercut in the video uh, a, a picture that I had put on Facebook of what a, a shipment of stuff looked like. And it, at that point it was like 20 different boxes. I think we had a chat. Do I click that? Do you click oh, that? actually, I can I can read it for you if you'd like. Right. Um, here's a question for you. Okay. And one says, did you find other military folks uh, became vegan because of your enthusiasm? Definitely not deployed. People were interested, especially people were interested, especially especially because in training. Hey, I'm a I'm a guy that's in great shape. Uh, I can never quite stick the run perfectly for a, for a PT test. So it, we, our standard was two miles. You have to run it at like 13 minutes. I could usually do it in 13, 10 or something like that. But push-ups and sit-ups, I could always max it out. And for guys that are that see that, they're like, hold on a second. We, for their whole lives, they had heard that vegans are unhealthy and this, that, and the other. And here I am lapping them doing more push-ups, sometimes 20, 30 more. You know, I went in the military a little bit older than most. So I was, uh, when I became a sergeant, I was like 30, 31. When I was in active or uh, reserve, I was in almost touching 40. So sometimes almost twice or, and there were, there were circumstances where I was, if there was an 18 year old and I'm 40, more than twice as old and in better shape. So it kind of blows minds and people thought about that. Not while we were deployed, though. While we were deployed, for the most part, we had these conversations, but people wouldn't want to do a strict anything. Nobody gave up smoking while you're deployed. Why? I mean, you, life is bad enough. You don't want to go into nicotine, nicotine withdrawal while you're also worried about getting blown up. And for as all I was able to do to make my life better or make it sustainable, yeah, being vegan in uh, Afghanistan is not something that uh, it's not something you should strive for, or uh, or like, man, I really hope I can do that someday. It was it was a, a guess to suck for. Um, so yeah, I was able to have some good conversations with people. People are were still interested in it, and I think a lot of it is I spread it in a positive way, with no dogma. I wasn't like you're bad or this or that for doing this. So I was like, hey, it's better for the planet, better for your overall health. It'd be kind of inconvenient, but that's the only the only downside. And do you think that influenced your decision to become an, a nurse? So for me, being a, a former medic, it was almost a one-to-one -one transition. In fact, be it's it's funny being a medic. You have too much uh, freedom. You could literally do whatever you think you need to do to save someone's life with no one telling you, giving you advice or anything. And then as an RN, I have very strict guidelines and very much a, I can only do a few things like, I mean, almost to the point where not literally, but you would almost need a doctor's order to put a bandaid on someone. 
is, is how, how it works. I mean, in, in real life, no, I don't, I'm obviously don't ask a doctor for that, but you know, whether check, check patient diet, uh, these meds you're going to give them. I can't give Tylenol without getting a doctor's order. You have to every med that I give some versus when I was a medic, uh, I just carried medicine and someone's sick. I looked at them. I was like, all right, well, all right. How are you feeling? All right. I see, you know, some bumps in your mouth and stuff and you have, you know, you learn, maybe we'll do an antibiotic, you know, and there was no way to do a, you know, a swab or a test to see if you, you were, had a bacterial infection. We would just, all right, let's, let's try, let's try this. Um, but usually most of my guys came down with the same thing. They got sick. They had some kind of uh, infection due to the food that they were eating. So then we, we gave them a whole bunch of medicine. Uh, so it was pretty much for me and in, in even transition being a medic to being an RN. The, the reason why I went this route to become an RN and get back in the medical field when I got out of the military, which I don't think I mentioned this, when I got out of the military, I was going to get uh, start a vegan restaurant. That's why I went to vegan culinary school. But this was like 2006. Vegan things still hadn't caught on. I couldn't find the right spot. I and as I looked and looked and time kind of started ticking, I just thought, you know, I, I need to be doing something right now. And then fast forward a couple of years, Haiti earthquake kicked off. I, I a, an NGO picked me up and uh, and paid for me to go to Haiti and help out in Haiti during the earthquake. And then I realized, hey, I need to be doing something like Maybe it's just the way my brain is wired, but I need to be doing something directly to help people or make the world a better place where I just get like wondering what I'm doing. So, you know. Wow. Well, that's such a noble um, character characteristic that you have. I mean, to be able to serve people and being so um, really giving about your time and your expertise and it's, it's really wonderful. It's such an inspiration. I'm so delighted to hear your story, and oh, thank you. I'm sure that everyone here is. It it adds a whole other level to um, what it means to be to be vegan as well. Thank you. So, yeah, I'm just checking to see if there's any other questions, any comments, anybody wants to either put in the chat box or. Uh, <laughs> Looks like we've got a couple of people. D Dunheim says thank you and. Um, George is also listening in. He's also in military. So, uh, is that McQuaid? Yes. Yay! Hey. <laughs> so it's wonderful. And just for those people to know, there there are a group of people who are vegan in the military. We've actually interviewed mm -hmm. Jay Pat. There's a Emerald, is a female in the military. There's there's vegans in the military. So it's really yeah. exciting. And I'm so glad that you were able to come here today and talk a bit about this. And I know that um, in defense of animals, our president, Dr. Marilyn Kroplick, is very interested in um, just exploring this a little bit further. And she also was in Afghanistan. And mm -hmm. she was also she's a practicing psychiatrist, but she was doing um, uh, she was practicing as a doctor there. So you may want to chat with her a bit about this. Not that many people I know were actually no, in Afghanistan. Not many, not many people. Af Afghanistan, it's a, Af it's just the whole thing was an interesting experience. I, I'm not saying I recommend it, but I remember, I remember looking at an article in time right before, well, before, even before I joined the military and it just looked like a modern day version of what it'd be like to be in the wild west and not necessarily in a good way and really that's kind of what the experience felt like mm -hmm. but in no way do i uh i recommend doing that and i mean it's an interesting country if they ever figured it out it would be pretty cool to check out but you know every now and again when tourists go there they're you know they get whacked it's yeah yeah, and it doesn't sound too safe. <laughs> uh, very low, low amount of safety. Yeah, I, I often like to joke and say safety last. And I mean, when you're in the military, it, it very much is safety last. But yeah, Afghanistan without, you know, just going, going it alone. I mean, mm. I feel especially bad for the local people. But yeah. Well, you have some kind of interesting life story, and I encourage everyone who's listening to pick up a copy of 
um, Sergeant Began's book, Vegan Strong, because then you'll hear a little bit more about his stories, more details, and lots of information in there about going vegan. And he shared a, like a tip of the iceberg with us today. So I want to thank you so much. This thank is you very really much. awesome. And I think it's totally inspiring to everyone what you've shared with us today and to go out and and help others and continue that with your your nursing with health and wellness and so and veganism is a big part of that and that's it is. great to share that with everyone thank you and if anyone has any further questions or you remember something i'm easily findable on the internet sgtvegan.com that's sgtvegan.com sgt underscore vegan or sgtvegan on facebook Yes, on Instagram, Facebook, all over. So Sergeant Vegan is definitely the handle you want to look for. So again, thanks to everyone for joining us um, for this Carnivores Anonymous online meeting. We hope you'll join us next time. We actually have Ebony McCormick, who's um, with us today, and she's going to be our speaker next time, which is one month away. And she is the uh, owner, CEO of the Healthy Dining app, which may be a, a solution for people who are looking for ways to connect uh, through veganism, although I don't know how that would help in Afghanistan, but it will help in the United you States. Have to have so. Mm -hmm. first, so. Yes, yeah, that's true. So to everyone, I want to wish you a happy holidays as well. That's coming up and please stay tuned to what we're doing. We're Carnivores Anonymous. Uh, we offer a 12-step uh, support for people who are wanting to take the vegan journey and to recover from meat and dairy addictions. So again, thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful evening. <laughs> thank you. Do I do anything or just click the red box? Nope, I, I'll click it for you. <laughs>